Hey everyone, back again with um, a drawing and then a painting. Um, I'm not speeding this up, it's going to be pretty real time. Um, and when I say pretty real time, I mean exactly real time. Because um, I think that might be a little more valuable. Um, the last video I did was similar to this, but sped up and... Um, I'm not sure if it was very clear on what I was doing and everything. So we're going to try it full time and I'm going to try to fill in an hour or so of talking. And also I'll probably play it like an audiobook um, halfway through when we get to the coloring. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, um, this drawing will eventually be um, a rhinoceros grinding his nose. Uh, to a very fine point on a grindstone. Um, just because I've uh, had a lot of work recently, uh, and I'm not complaining, but um, the term uh, notice the grindstone has definitely been in my mind um, for a while. I haven't had too much time to devote to personal projects and um, uh, things that I most want to do. Um, again, art directors not complaining. Love working on things. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's. I was feeling kind of drained, but I I wanted to do something. So I thought of that um, that uh, what is it a pun? It's pretty. It's definitely a visual pun. Um, so yeah, here, here's some drawing. I, I did a thumbnail and then um, I scanned it in, blew it up, and printed it. Um, also worked a little bit on the background uh, in Photoshop. Um, then printed it larger. Um, and I actually went over it with a blue pencil on um, tracing paper. That's what's under this um, marker paper that I'm working on top of. And I'm drawing with a black wing pencil. Um, and I've probably talked about them before. Um, they're pretty much the best pencil um, for this technique. Of course, uh, there's probably like a cult following of, of this certain tool, and I'm not I'm not in that camp probably um, because. Lots of people use lots of things to make awesome stuff. So um, it's probably less about the tool and more of what I want out of it. Um, but the reason I like it is um, it kind of works as like a miniature brush. Like uh, the more pressure you put on it, obviously, it's very easy to make it darker um, and actually thicken the line. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's a, it's a solid point, but, um, you know, over usage, I'll, uh, the point will get dull, um, and that uh, it just creates a totally different effect if you use it lightly and then um, also press harder on it. And I'm not going to resharpen this um, pencil for the whole time uh, this drawing, which is probably I spent let's see, about 30 minutes doing this drawing. So um, by the end of it, it's going to be dull, but it's going to be giving me um, thicker lines, thicker and bolder lines when I want it to, when I want to press hard on it, and also softer uh, shadows and shades when I press lightly on it. So um, I take that into, I take, I, I have that in mind when I start the drawing and when I finish it because um, when you start it, it's got thinner lines because um, it's so sharp. And you can still get bold lines, obviously, but the thinner lines, you know, I I kind of want to keep in the background. You know, the background needs to fall away um, at least ever so much um, and not be in, in uh, great... Compos uh, sorry, competition with the uh, foreground element or whatever I'm, whatever I want to highlight. 
So um, I'm going to be probably working around, see I'm thinking how I, how I drew this. Uh, I'm probably going to draw the rhino in the center um, uh, later uh, after I've got all my, all my background elements um, drawn. Um, so the rhino will be bolder and darker. Uh, somewhat. Also, it's it's a good warm up. I mean, I mean, I haven't been I, you know I haven't been drawing all day. I've been actually painting all day uh, when I drew this um, digitally. So I mean, my hands are warmed up. But as far as you know, seeing line on a page, um, this is a good warm up. You know, doing the stuff that's not as crucial uh, in the drawing. Um, before I get into the, the thing that I want, you know, I want to be the most awesome part of the piece, um, which is the rhino, and I'm going into it right now. Um, took a chance with, uh, with um, readability on this one. I wanted his, uh, his right arm, his hand, to be actually pressing down on his nose, on his uh, horn. Um, and now that I say that, you can probably uh, see that, but, um, you know, it's not super clear. So I've got that arm uh, hidden behind the, the grindstone wheel. That's okay. I'm really trying a lot of different things with this uh, drawing. I don't know if it makes any difference to you guys, but for me, I was trying to um, draw a little bit more realistically, uh, if that's a word, if that means anything these days. Um, less, uh, kids book, um, like, uh, some of my previous images. Um, a little grittier, a little, um, more snags and crags and uh, jags. <laughs> oh no, how long can I keep this up? Um, basically a little bit more, uh, like a little bit more detail um, in the figures and in the, in the background. Here I'm going into the grindstone and I, I didn't you know, I always want I, I want to put movement into my drawings. Um, I, would, I wouldn't say always, but for this one I did because you know the grind sense going around and it's going fast. Um, I didn't have a clear idea of how that would work. Um, so instead of uh, so when I was drawing it, it kind of just came to me to not. Uh, draw the contour of the stone perfectly. So I'm I'm basically creating an effect of of uh, with those sketched lines of it turning. Um, and it, you know, it, something if something's going so fast, it's it's like a blur. So um, try and try that. I, I don't think I've done that before on anything. So that was exciting. Um, this grindstone, uh, I tried something else as well, which is look up reference. I rarely look up reference. I may have acted like I did in the past, but I'm really bad at that. Um, I looked up reference for, uh, this farm stuff, uh, this grindstone included, um, as well as the rhinestone, or sorry, the rhino, <laughs> um, 
and I think it helped out a lot um, in just the the believability of it. You know, when you look up when you look up um, and use reference, it's not so much that people who know about this stuff are going to be like, oh, yeah, you know, that's so accurate. You know, it's so, it's so believable because, you know, that's exactly how a grindstone works. Um, that's exactly how a barn looks. Um, it's not so much that, or at least I'm not worried about that so much, um, as in, as in making it look interesting, making it look, um, fun, uh, I think there's that, there's that dichotomy that people think, or at least I thought, which is, you know, imagination is way more fun than the realistic nature of things, um, but I'm, I'm realizing that, you know, the more you know about, um, you know, the human body, about farm equipment, the more you can push and pull and, and, um, the more you have to work with, um, in terms of making it your own, using your imagination, um, you're building up that visual library of, you know, in this case, um, sort of caged machinery, um, farm equipment, which I believe will help me in the future on a project that I want to, I want to do. Uh, I don't want to speak about it right now because That'd probably be unwise. And the rhino tail is the last thing I had to the rhino. It's actually the last thing I painted, uh, which is funny enough. Just forget that tail, but as I said before, I looked at research online, so I know how a rhino looks. Tools in the background. Um, something that stuck with me. Um, that I saw on Sam uh, Bosma's Twitter um, after he did, um, what is it called? Um, it's a comic he made called The Tower. I'm gonna look it up. One second. The Hanging Tower. Um, I have it as a PDF. I got it from his online store, and it's sweet. Um, I mean, I love comics. Who doesn't love comics? <laughs> and um, it's awesome. Like his uh, his backgrounds are so um, well produced. Uh, you know, they just all look so cool. Um, and it's a backdrop to the story, which is the main thing, obviously, but it, it, it helps out greatly, um, the believability, the world, uh, in which these characters and the story is happening. Um, and he, I think he posted about that on Twitter once, um, and said, um, more or less that this was something he was definitely going after, which is the, um, the backgrounds, uh, to put thought into it. Um, so I've always remembered that, um, and that's helped me out a lot in um, the past drawings I've done, and obviously this one. Uh, excuse me. Um, yeah, so great advice from Sam Bosma. And definitely check out his work, definitely get his comics, all of them. Um, fantasy sports stuff that he did with no brow um, are really good.
because I've been so busy with work, uh, this is actually, uh, I made this late, um, later, uh, last night. Uh, it wasn't like super late or anything. I think it was like at like 9.30 to 10 o'clock and then I went to bed at 10. Um, and I woke up this morning to finish the painting. Um, so definitely feeling what this rhino is doing. Um, it's getting to work, getting my tool sharpened. In order to get bread on the table, in order to get done with projects, Um, as I said before, this is this is marker paper, um, and uh, I'll tell you the brand. Let me see. Uh, the brand is Canson. Uh, it's called Pro Layout Marker Paper, and I get a big sheet, uh, a big uh, uh, pad of it, fourteen by seventeen, because you just never know how big your drawing is going to be. Alright, I've probably run out of things to say. I'm lacking on coffee and I'm probably not too interesting. So if you stuck with me this long, um, good. I'm glad. Uh, now I would like to play for your listening enjoyment. Uh, the War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. Um, if you haven't heard it, um, good, because this is your first time here. Um, it's something that I listened to like three years ago when I was first starting out as a professional illustrator. Um, and I've listened to it, I mean, probably every month in that year. Uh, and then, you know, I started listening to it again this morning. And um, I've listened to it, it's probably like, I don't know, just any time when I'm feeling not interested in working or burnt out or whatever, uh, it's just always a great um, pickup uh, and encouragement to keep doing um, your craft, keep exercising your your skill, um, and just to keep going. So uh, here it is. Uh, it's probably only have time for like an hour and a bit and it's I think it's a three hour book um, so you get uh, the first bit here and you should get the, the rest of it on Audible uh, I'll probably put a link on the bottom of this YouTube video um, but if uh, if any kids are watching if anyone has kids that are watching there's a few uh, language parts. Um, I'll try to cut those out, but but we'll see. Uh, I may not be able to get them all. Uh, and definitely the whole book um, is, is definitely more of an adult book. Um, the principles are for everyone, I think, but uh, it's not like he's writing specifically to kids. Um, so here it goes. Hope you enjoy. This audio program is presented by Audible.com. Audible, audio that speaks to you wherever you are. Recorded Books presents an unabridged recording of The War of Art, Winning the Inner Creative Battle by Stephen Pressfield, narrated by George Guidel. This book is copyrighted 2002 by Stephen Pressfield. This recording is copyrighted 2003 by Recorded Books. This book opens with the following forward by Robert McKee. Stephen Pressfield wrote The War of Art for me. He undoubtedly wrote it for you, too, 
but I know he did it expressly for me, because I hold Olympic records for procrastination. I can procrastinate thinking about my procrastination problem. I can procrastinate dealing with my problem of procrastinating thinking about my procrastination problem. So Pressfield, that devil, asked me to write this forward against a deadline, knowing that no matter how much I stalled, eventually I'd have to knuckle down and do the work. At the last possible hour, I did, and as I leafed through book one, defining the enemy, I saw myself staring back guilty-eyed from every page. But then book two gave me a battle plan, book three a vision of victory, and as I closed the war of art, I felt a surge of positive calm. I now know I can win this war, and if I can, so can you. To begin book one, Pressfield labels the enemy of creativity resistance, his all-encompassing term for what Freud called the death wish, that destructive force inside human nature that rises whenever we consider a tough, long-term course of action that might do for us or others something that's actually good. He then presents a rogues gallery of the many manifestations of resistance. You will recognize each and every one, for this force lives within us all. Self-sabotage, self-deception, self-corruption. We writers know it as block, a paralysis whose symptoms can bring on appalling behavior. Some years ago, I was as blocked as a Calcutta sewer, so what did I do? I decided to try on all my clothes. To show just how anal I can get, I put on every shirt, pair of pants, sweater, jacket, and sock, sorting them into piles, spring, summer, fall, winter, Salvation Army. Then I tried them on all over again, this time parsing them into spring casual, spring formal, summer casual. Two days of this, and I thought I was going mad. Want to know how to cure writer's block? It's not a trip to your psychiatrist, for as Pressfield wisely points out, seeking support is resistance at its most seductive. No, the cure is found in book two, Turning Pro. Stephen Pressfield is the very definition of a pro. I know this because I can't count the times I called the author of The Legend of Bagger Vance to invite him for a round of golf, and although tempted, he declined. Why? Because he was working. And as any writer who has ever taken a backswing knows, golf is a beautifully virulent form of procrastination. In other words, resistance. Steve packs a discipline forged of Bethlehem steel. I read Steve's Gates of Fire and Tides of War back to back while traveling in Europe. Now, I'm not a lacrimose guy. I hadn't cried over a book since The Red Pony, but these novels got to me. I found myself sitting in cafes, choking back tears over the selfless courage of those Greeks who shaped and saved Western civilization. As I looked beneath his seamless prose and sensed his depth of research, of knowledge of human nature and society, of vividly imagined telling details, I was in awe of the work, the work, all the work that built the foundation of his riveting creations. And I'm not alone in this appreciation. When I bought the books in London, I was told that Steve's novels are now assigned by Oxford history dons who tell their students that if they wish to rub shoulders with life in classical Greece, read Pressfield. How does an artist achieve that power? In the second book, Pressfield lays out the day-by-day, step-by-step campaign of the professional. Preparation, order, patience, endurance, acting in the face of fear and failure. No excuses, no bullshit. And best of all, Steve's brilliant insight that first, last, and always, the professional focuses on mastery of the craft. Book three, The Higher Realm, looks at inspiration, that sublime result that blossoms in the furrows of the professional 
who straps on the harness and plows the fields of his or her art. In Pressfield's words, when we sit down each day and do our work, power concentrates around us. We become like a magnetized rod that attracts iron filings. Ideas come. Insights accrete. On this, the effect of inspiration, Steve and I absolutely agree. Indeed, stunning images and ideas arrive as if from nowhere. In fact, these seemingly spontaneous flashes are so amazing, it's hard to believe that our unworthy selves created them. From where, therefore, does our best stuff come? It's on this point, however, the cause of inspiration, that we see things differently. In Book One, Steve traces resistance down its evolutionary roots to the genes. I agree, the cause is genetic. That negative force, that dark antagonism to creativity, is embedded deep in our humanity. But in Book Three, he shifts gears and looks for the cause of inspiration, not in human nature, but on a higher realm. Then, with a poetic fire, he lays out his belief in muses and angels. The ultimate source of creativity, he argues, is divine. Many, perhaps most, readers will find Book Three profoundly moving. I, on the other hand, believe that the source of creativity is found on the same plane of reality as resistance. It, too, is genetic. It's called talent, the innate power to discover the hidden connection between two things, images, ideas, words, that no one else has ever seen before, link them, and create for the world a third, utterly unique work. Like our IQ, talent is a gift from our ancestors. If we're lucky, we inherit it. In the fortunate talented few, the dark dimension of their natures will first resist the labor that creativity demands, but once they commit to the task, their talented side stirs to action and rewards them with astonishing feats. These flashes of creative genius seem to arrive from out of the blue for the obvious reason. They come from the unconscious mind. In short, if the muse exists, she does not whisper to the untalented. So although Steve and I may differ on the cause, we agree on the effect. When inspiration touches talent, she gives birth to truth and beauty. And when Stephen Pressfield was writing The War of Art, she had her hands all over him. And now, The War of Art. What I do. I get up, take a shower, I have breakfast. I read the paper, brush my teeth. If I have phone calls to make, I make them. I've got my coffee now. I put on my lucky work boots and stitch up the lucky laces that my niece Meredith gave me. I head back to my office, crank up the computer. My lucky hooded sweatshirt is draped over the chair with the lucky charm I got from a gypsy in Sainte Marie de la Mer for only eight bucks and francs, and my lucky Largo name tag that came from a dream I once had. I put it on. On my thesaurus is my lucky cannon that my friend Bob Versandi gave me from Moro Castle, Cuba. I point it toward my chair so it can fire inspiration into me. I say my prayer, which is the invocation of the muse from Homer's Odyssey, translation by T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, which my dear mate Paul Riggs gave me and which sits near my shelf with the cufflinks that belonged to my father and my lucky acorn from the battlefield at Thermopylae. It's about 10.30 now. I sit down and plunge in. When I start making typos, I know I'm getting tired. That's four hours or so. I've hit the point of diminishing returns. I wrap for the day copy whatever I've done to disk, and stash the disk in the glove compartment of my truck in case there's a fire and I have to run for it. I power down. It's 3, 3.30. The office is closed. How many pages have I produced? 
I don't care. Are they any good? I don't even think about it. All that matters is I've put in my time and hit it with all I've got. All that counts is that for this day, for this session, I have overcome resistance. What I know. There's a secret that real writers know that wannabe writers don't. And the secret is this. It's not the writing part that's hard. What's hard is sitting down to write. What keeps us from sitting down is resistance. The unlived life. Most of us have two lives. The life we live and the unlived life within us. Between the two stands resistance. Have you ever brought home a treadmill and let it gather dust in the attic? Ever quit a diet, a course of yoga, a meditation practice? Have you ever bailed out on a call to embark upon a spiritual practice, dedicate yourself to a humanitarian calling, commit your life to the service of others? Have you ever wanted to be a mother, a doctor, an advocate for the weak and helpless, to run for office, crusade for the planet, campaign for world peace, or to preserve the environment. Late at night, have you experienced a vision of the person you might become, the work you could accomplish, the realized being you were meant to be? Are you a writer who doesn't write, a painter who doesn't paint, an entrepreneur who never starts a venture? Then you know what resistance is. One night I was laying down. I heard Papa talking to Mama. I heard Papa say to let that boy boogie woogie because it's in him and it's got to come out. John Lee Hooker, boogie chillin. Resistance is the most toxic force on the planet. It is the root of more unhappiness than poverty, disease, and erectile dysfunction. To yield to resistance deforms our spirit. It stunts us and makes us less than we are and were born to be. If you believe in God, and I do, you must declare resistance evil, for it prevents us from achieving the life God intended when he endowed each of us with our own unique genius. Genius is a Latin word. The Romans used it to denote an inner spirit, holy and inviolable, which watches over us, guiding us to our calling. A writer writes with his Genius, an artist paints with hers. Everyone who creates operates from this sacramental center. It is our soul's seat, the vessel that holds our being in potential, our star's beacon and polaris. Every sun casts a shadow, and genius's shadow is resistance. As powerful as is our soul's call to realization, so potent are the forces of resistance arrayed against it. Resistance is faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive, harder to kick than crack cocaine. We're not alone if we've been mowed down by resistance. Millions of good men and women have bitten the dust before us. And here's the biggest bitch. We don't even know what hit us. I never did. From age 24 to 32... Resistance kicked my ass from East Coast to West and back again 13 times, and I never even knew it existed. I looked everywhere for the enemy and failed to see it right in front of my face. Have you heard this story? Woman learns she has cancer, six months to live. Within days, she quits her job, resumes the dream of writing Tex-Mex songs she gave up to raise a family, or starts studying classical Greek, or moves to the inner city and devotes herself to tending babies with AIDS. Woman's friends think she's crazy. She herself has never been happier. There's a postscript. Woman's cancer goes into remission. Is that what it takes? Do we have to stare death in the face to make us stand up and confront resistance? Does resistance have to cripple and disfigure our lives before we wake up to its existence? How many of us have become drunks and drug addicts, developed tumors and neuroses, succumbed to painkillers, gossip and compulsive cell phone use, simply because we don't do that thing that our hearts, our inner genius, is calling us to? Resistance defeats us. 
If tomorrow morning, by some stroke of magic, every dazed and benighted soul woke up with the power to take the first step toward pursuing his or her dreams, every shrink in the directory would be out of business. Prisons would stand empty. The alcohol and tobacco industries would collapse, along with the junk food, cosmetic surgery, and infotainment businesses, not to mention pharmaceutical companies, hospitals, and the medical profession from top to bottom. Domestic abuse would become extinct, as would addiction, obesity, migraine headaches, road rage, and dandruff. Look in your own heart. Unless I'm crazy, right now a still small voice is piping up, telling you, as it has 10,000 times, the calling that is yours and yours alone. You know it. No one has to tell you. And unless I'm crazy, you're no closer to taking action on it than you were yesterday, or will be tomorrow. You think resistance isn't real? Resistance will bury you. You know, Hitler wanted to be an artist. At 18, he took his inheritance, 700 kronen, and moved to Vienna to live and study. He applied to the Academy of Fine Arts and later to the School of Architecture. Ever see one of his paintings? Neither have I. Resistance beat him. Call it overstatement, but I'll say it anyway. It was easier for Hitler to start World War II than it was for him to face a blank square of canvas. Book One, Resistance, Defining the Enemy. The enemy is a very good teacher, the Dalai Lama. Resistance's greatest hits. The following is a list, in no particular order, of those activities that most commonly elicit resistance. One, the pursuit of any calling in writing, painting, music, film, dance, or any creative art, however marginal or unconventional. Two, the launching of any entrepreneurial venture or enterprise for profit or otherwise. Three, any diet or health regimen. Four, any program of spiritual advancement. Five, any activity whose aim is tighter abdominals. Six, any course or program designed to overcome an unwholesome habit or addiction. Seven, education of every kind. Eight, any act of political, moral, or ethical courage including the decision to change for the better some unworthy pattern of thought or conduct in ourselves. Nine, the undertaking of any enterprise or endeavor whose aim is to help others. Ten, any act that entails commitment of the heart. The decision to get married, to have a child, to weather a rocky patch in a relationship. Eleven, the taking of any principled stand in the face of adversity. In other words, any act that rejects immediate gratification in favor of long-term growth, health, or integrity, or, expressed another way, any act that derives from our higher nature instead of our lower, any of these will elicit resistance. Now, what are the characteristics of resistance? Resistance is invisible. Resistance cannot be seen, touched, heard, or smelled, but it can be felt. We experience it as an energy field radiating from a work in potential. It's a repelling force. It's negative. Its aim is to shove us away, distract us, prevent us from doing our work. Resistance is internal. Resistance seems to come from outside ourselves. We locate it in spouses, jobs, bosses, kids, peripheral opponents, as Pat Riley used to say when he coached the Los Angeles Lakers. Resistance is not a peripheral opponent. Resistance arises from within. It is self-generated and self-perpetuated. Resistance is the enemy within. Resistance is insidious. Resistance will tell you anything to keep you from doing your work. It will perjure, fabricate, falsify, seduce, bully, cajole. Resistance is protean. It will assume any form if that's what it takes to deceive you. It will reason with you like a lawyer or jam a nine millimeter in your face like a stick-up man. 
Resistance has no conscience. It will pledge anything to get a deal, then double-cross you as soon as your back is turned. If you take resistance at its word, you deserve everything you get. Resistance is always lying and always full of shit. Resistance is implacable. Resistance is like the alien, or the terminator, or the shark in Jaws. It cannot be reasoned with. It understands nothing but power. It is an engine of destruction programmed from the factory with one object only, to prevent us from doing our work. Resistance is implacable, intractable, indefatigable. Reduce it to a single cell, and that cell will continue to attack. This is resistance's nature. It's all it knows. Resistance is impersonal. Resistance is not out to get you personally. It doesn't know who you are and doesn't care. Resistance is a force of nature. It acts objectively. Though it feels malevolent, resistance, in fact, operates with the indifference of rain and transits the heavens by the same laws as the stars. When we marshal our forces to combat resistance... We must remember this. Resistance is infallible. Like a magnetized needle floating on a surface of oil, resistance will unfailingly point to true north, meaning that calling or action it most wants to stop us from doing. We can use this. We can use it as a compass. We can navigate by resistance letting it guide us to that calling or action that we must follow before all others. Rule of thumb, the more important a call or action is to our soul's evolution, the more resistance we will feel toward pursuing it. Resistance is universal. We're wrong if we think we're the only ones struggling with resistance. Everyone who has a body experiences resistance. Resistance never sleeps. Henry Fonda was still throwing up before each stage performance, even when he was 75. In other words, fear doesn't go away. The warrior and the artist live by the same code of necessity which dictates that the battle must be fought anew every day. Resistance plays for keeps. Resistance's goal is not to wound or disable. Resistance aims to kill. Its target is the epicenter of our being, our genius, our soul, the unique and priceless gift we were put on earth to give and that no one else has but us. Resistance means business. When we fight it, we're in a war to the death. Resistance is fueled by fear. Resistance has no strength of its own. Every ounce of juice it possesses comes from us. We feed it with power by our fear of it. Master that fear, and we conquer resistance. Resistance only opposes in one direction. Resistance obstructs movement only from a lower sphere to a higher. It kicks in when we seek to pursue a calling in the arts, launch an innovative enterprise, or evolve to a higher station morally, ethically, or spiritually. So, if you're in Calcutta, working with the Mother Teresa Foundation, and you're thinking of bolting to launch a career in telemarketing, relax. Resistance will give you a free pass. Resistance is most powerful at the finish line. Odysseus almost got home years before his actual homecoming. Ithaca was in sight, close enough that the sailors could see the smoke of their family's fires on shore. Odysseus was so certain he was safe, he actually lay down for a snooze. It was then that his men, believing there was gold in an oxhide sack among their commander's possessions, snatched this prize and cut it open. The bag contained the adverse winds which King Aeolus had bottled up for Odysseus when the wanderer had touched earlier at his blessed isle. The winds burst forth now in one mad blow, driving Odysseus's ships back across every league of ocean they had with such difficulty traversed. 
making him endure further trials and sufferings before, at last and alone, he reached home for good. The danger is greatest when the finish line is in sight. At this point, resistance knows we're about to beat it. It hits the panic button. It marshals one last assault and slams us with everything it's got. The professional must be alert for this counterattack. Be wary at the end. Don't open that bag of wind. Resistance recruits allies. Resistance, by definition, is self-sabotage, but there's a parallel peril that must also be guarded against, sabotage by others. When a writer begins to overcome her resistance, in other words, when she actually starts to write, she may find that those close to her begin acting strange. They may become moody or sullen. They may get sick. They may accuse the awakening writer of changing, of not being the person she was. The closer these people are to the awakening writer, the more bizarrely they will act and the more emotion they will put behind their actions. They are trying to sabotage her. The reason is that they are struggling consciously or unconsciously, against their own resistance. The awakening writer's success becomes a reproach to them. If she can beat these demons, why can't they? Often, couples or close friends, even entire families, will enter into tacit compacts whereby each individual pledges unconsciously to remain mired in the same slough in which she and all her cronies have become so comfortable. The highest treason a crab can commit is to make a leap for the rim of the bucket. The awakening artist must be ruthless, not only with herself, but with others. Once you make your break, you can't turn around for your buddy who catches his trouser leg on the barbed wire. The best thing you can do for that friend, and he'd tell you this himself if he really is your friend, is to get over the wall and keep motating. The best and only thing that one artist can do for another is to serve as an example and an inspiration. Now, let's consider the next aspect of resistance. Symptoms. Resistance and procrastination. Procrastination is the most common manifestation of resistance because it's the easiest to rationalize. We don't tell ourselves I'm never going to write my symphony. Instead, we say, I'm going to write my symphony. I'm just going to start tomorrow. Resistance and Procrastination, Part 2 The most pernicious aspect of procrastination is that it can become a habit. We don't just put off our lives today. We put them off till our deathbed. Never forget, this very moment, we can change our lives. There never was a moment, and never will be, when we are without the power to alter our destiny. This second, we can turn the tables on resistance. This second, we can sit down and do our work. Resistance and trouble. We get ourselves in trouble because it's a cheap way to get attention. Trouble is a faux form of fame. It's easier to get busted in the bedroom with the faculty chairman's wife than it is to finish that dissertation on the metaphysics of Motley in the novellas of Joseph Conrad. Ill health is a form of trouble, as are alcoholism and drug addiction, proneness to accidents, all neurosis, including compulsive screwing up, and such seemingly benign foibles as jealousy, chronic lateness, and the blasting of rap music at 110 dB from your smoked glass 95 Supra. Anything that draws attention to ourselves through pain-free or artificial means is a manifestation of resistance. Cruelty to others is a form of resistance, as is the willing endurance of cruelty from others. The working artist will not tolerate trouble in her life because she knows trouble prevents her from doing her work. 
the working artist banishes from her world all sources of trouble. She harnesses the urge for trouble and transforms it in her work. Resistance and Self-Dramatization Creating soap opera in our lives is a symptom of resistance. Why put in years of work designing a new software interface when you can get just as much attention by bringing home a boyfriend with a prison record? Sometimes entire families participate unconsciously in a culture of self-dramatization. The kids fuel the tanks, the grown-ups arm the phasers, the whole starship lurches from one spine-tingling episode to another, and the crew knows how to keep it going. If the level of drama drops below a certain threshold, someone jumps in to amp it up. Dad gets drunk, Mom gets sick, Janie shows up for church with an Oakland Raiders tattoo. It's more fun than a movie, and it works. Nobody gets a damn thing done. Sometimes I think of resistance as a sort of evil twin to Santa Claus, who makes his rounds house to house, making sure that everything's taken care of. When he comes to a house that's hooked on self-dramatization, his ruddy cheeks glow, and he giddy-ups away behind his eight tiny reindeer. He knows there'll be no work done in that house. Resistance and self-medication. Do you regularly ingest any substance, controlled or otherwise, whose aim is the alleviation of depression, anxiety, etc.? I offer the following experience. I once worked as a writer for a big New York ad agency. Our boss used to tell us, invent a disease, come up with the disease, he said, and we can sell the cure. Attention deficit disorder, seasonal affect disorder, social anxiety disorder, these aren't diseases. They're marketing ploys. Doctors didn't discover them. Copywriters did. Marketing departments did. Drug companies did. Depression and anxiety may be real, but they can also be resistance. When we drug ourselves to blot out our soul's call, we are being good Americans and exemplary consumers. We're doing exactly what TV commercials and pop materialist culture have been brainwashing us to do from birth. Instead of applying self-knowledge, self-discipline, delayed gratification, and hard work, we simply consume a product. Many pedestrians have been maimed or killed at the intersection of resistance and commerce. Resistance and victimhood. Doctors estimate that 70 to 80 percent of their business is non-health related. People aren't sick. They're self-dramatizing. Sometimes the hardest part of a medical job is keeping a straight face. As Jerry Seinfeld observed of his 20 years of dating, that's a lot of acting fascinated. The acquisition of a condition lends significance to one's existence. An illness, a cross to bear. Some people go from condition to condition. They cure one and another pops up to take its place. The condition becomes a work of art in itself, a shadow version of the real creative act the victim is avoiding by expending so much care cultivating his condition. A victim act is a form of passive aggression. It seeks to achieve gratification not by honest work or a contribution made out of one's experience or insight or love but by the manipulation of others through silent and not-so-silent threat. The victim compels others to come to his rescue or to behave as he wishes by holding them hostage to the prospect of his own further illness, meltdown, mental dissolution, or simply by threatening to make their lives so miserable that they do what he wants. Casting yourself as a victim is the antithesis of doing your work. Don't do it. If you're doing it, stop. Resistance and the choice of a mate. Sometimes, if we're not conscious of our own resistance, we'll pick as a mate someone who has or is successfully overcoming resistance. I'm not sure why. 
Maybe it's easier to endow our partner with the power that we in fact possess, but are afraid to act upon. Maybe it's less threatening to believe that our beloved spouse is worthy to live out his or her unlived life while we are not. Or maybe we're hoping to use our mate as a model. Maybe we believe, or wish we could, that some of our spouse's power will rub off on us if we just hang around it long enough. This is how resistance disfigures love. The stew it creates is rich, it's colorful. Tennessee Williams could work it up into a trilogy, but is it love? If we're the supporting partner, shouldn't we face our own failure to pursue our unlived life rather than hitchhike on our spouse's coattails? And if we're the supported partner, shouldn't we step out from the glow of our loved one's adoration and instead encourage him to let his own light shine? Resistance and this book. When I began this book, resistance almost beat me. This is the form it took. It told me, the voice in my head, that I was a writer of fiction, not non-fiction, and that I shouldn't be exposing these concepts of resistance literally and overtly. Rather, I should incorporate them metaphorically into a novel. That's a pretty damn subtle and convincing argument. The rationalization resistance presented me with was that I should write, say, a war piece in which the principles of resistance were expressed as the fear a warrior feels. Resistance also told me I shouldn't seek to instruct or put myself forward as a purveyor of wisdom that this was vain, egotistical, possibly even corrupt, and that it would work harm to me in the end. That scared me. It made a lot of sense. What finally convinced me to go ahead was simply that I was so unhappy not going ahead. I was developing symptoms. As soon as I sat down and began, I was okay. Resistance and unhappiness. What does resistance feel like? First, unhappiness. We feel like hell. A low-grade misery pervades everything. We're bored, we're restless, we can't get no satisfaction. There's guilt, but we can't put our finger on the source. We want to go back to bed. We want to get up and party. We feel unloved and unlovable. We're disgusted. We hate our lives. We hate ourselves. Unalleviated, resistance mounts to a pitch that becomes unendurable. At this point, vices kick in. Dope, adultery, web surfing. Beyond that, resistance becomes clinical. Depression, aggression, dysfunction. Then actual crime and physical self-destruction. Sounds like life, I know. It isn't. It's resistance. What makes it tricky is that we live in a consumer culture that's acutely aware of this unhappiness and has massed all its profit-seeking artillery to exploit it by selling us a product, a drug, a distraction. As artists and professionals, it is our obligation to enact our own internal revolution, a private insurrection inside our own skulls. In this uprising, we free ourselves from the tyranny of consumer culture. We overthrow the programming of advertising, movies, video games, magazines, TV, and MTV by which we have been hypnotized from the cradle. We unplug ourselves from the grid by recognizing that we will never cure our restlessness by contributing our disposable income to the bottom line of Bullshit Incorporated, but only by doing our work. Resistance and Fear Are you paralyzed with fear? That's a good sign. Fear is good. Like self-doubt, fear is an indicator. Fear tells us what we have to do. Remember our rule of thumb. The more scared we are of a work or calling, the more sure we can be that we have to do it. Resistance is experienced as fear. The degree of fear equates to the strength of resistance. Therefore, the more fear we feel about a specific enterprise, the more certain we can be 
that that enterprise is important to us and to the growth of our soul. That's why we feel so much resistance. If it meant nothing to us, there'd be no resistance. Have you ever watched Inside the Actor's Studio? The host, James Lipton, invariably asks his guests what factors make you decide to take a particular role. The actor always answers, because I'm afraid of it. The professional tackles the project that will make him stretch. He takes on the assignment that will bear him into uncharted waters, compel him to explore unconscious parts of himself. Is he scared? Hell yes. He's petrified. Conversely, the professional turns down roles that he's done before. He's not afraid of them anymore. Why waste his time? So if you're paralyzed with fear, it's a good sign. It shows you what you have to do. Resistance and love. Resistance is directly proportional to love. If you're feeling massive resistance, the good news is it means there's tremendous love there too. If you didn't love the project that is terrifying you, you wouldn't feel anything. The opposite of love isn't hate. It's indifference. The more resistance you experience, the more important your unmanifested art, project, enterprise is to you, and the more gratification you will feel when you finally do it. Resistance and being a star. Grandiose fantasies are a symptom of resistance. They're the sign of an amateur. The professional has learned that success, like happiness, comes as a byproduct of work. The professional concentrates on the work and allows rewards to come or not come, whatever they like. Resistance and Isolation Sometimes we balk at embarking on an enterprise because we're afraid of being alone. We feel comfortable with the tribe around us. It makes us nervous going off into the woods on our own. Here's the trick. We're never alone. As soon as we step outside the campfire glow, our muse lights on our shoulder like a butterfly. The act of courage calls forth infallibly that deeper part of ourselves that supports and sustains us. Have you seen interviews with the young John Lennon or Bob Dylan? when the reporter tries to ask about their personal selves? The boys deflect these queries with withering sarcasm. Why? Because Lennon and Dylan know that the part of them that writes the songs is not them, not the personal self that is of such surpassing fascination to their boneheaded interrogators. Lennon and Dylan also know that the part of themselves that does the writing is too sacred, too precious, too fragile, to be redacted into sound bites for the titillation of would-be idolaters, who are themselves caught up in their own resistance. So they put them on and blow them off. It is a commonplace among artists and children at play that they're not aware of time or solitude while they're chasing their vision. The hours fly. The sculptress and the tree-climbing tyke both look up blinking when mom calls, supper time. Resistance and Isolation, Part 2. Friends sometimes ask, don't you get lonely sitting by yourself all day? At first it seemed odd to hear myself answer, no. Then I realized that I was not alone. I was in the book. I was with the characters. I was with myself. Not only do I not feel alone with my characters, they are more vivid and interesting to me than the people in my real life. If you think about it, the case can't be otherwise. In order for a book or any project or enterprise to hold our attention for the length of time it takes to unfold itself, it has to plug into some internal perplexity or passion that is of paramount importance to us. That problem becomes the theme of our work, even if we can't at the start understand or articulate it. As the characters arise, each embodies infallibly an aspect of that dilemma, that perplexity. These characters might not be interesting to anyone else, but they're absolutely fascinating to us. They are us. 
meaner, smarter, sexier versions of ourselves. It's fun to be with them because they're wrestling with the same issue that has its hooks into us. They're our soulmates, our lovers, our best friends, even the villains, especially the villains. Even in a book like this, which has no characters, I don't feel alone because I'm imagining the reader, whom I conjure as an aspiring artist, much like my own younger, less grizzled self, to whom I hope to impart a little starch and inspiration and prime a little with some hard knocks, wisdom, and a few tricks of the trade. All right, that was the uh, first part of War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. Um, as I said before, you should definitely get the full um, book on Audible uh, or wherever you get audiobooks. Um, hope it was interesting. Um, there's a lot of stuff to talk about with that. There's a lot of um, things to agree with or maybe disagree with. And um, But the uh, majority of it, I believe, is very true. Um, just in my, old li uh, my own life um, dealing with resistance and um, you know, that, uh, drive to not do work. <laughs> um, some people say, you know, they're just so caught up with work and th they lose track of time. And, um, and if that's true, uh, they are definitely winning against resistance. And, um, uh, it does happen. Um, but, uh, like you said in the book, it is a struggle and, uh, you know, I wish everyone the best of luck on that. Um, just, you know, waking up, getting in your chair, doing artwork, um, whenever you can. Um, that's, that's what will get you to um, the place you want to be as an artist. Um, it's funny thinking, you know, when I'm busy, I'm sedentary. I'm sitting. I, I always think that's pretty funny. So we think of bus busyness as movement, but... Um, it's actually a lot of sitting. Um, anyway, this is uh, come to a close. Um, the painting, I hope, was self-explanatory. I pretty much did uh, a lot with um, painting on the same layer, uh, or at least continuing to flatten down on the, onto one layer, and um, having a pretty simple um, um, background color. Uh, I just used one brush from Kyle T. Webster's Mega Brush set. Uh, it was, I think it's called pa Pastel Palooza, uh, and it is sweet. Love the texture. Um, and then I worked with uh, a lot of adjustment layers up there, at the top of my my layer bar. Um, Sometimes I flatten those down onto each of my layers, like my line layer and also the snowflakes and stuff. Um, but it just ends up, you know, flattening the luminosity, I believe. Um, don't have a technical word for it, but uh, yeah, it just loses a little bit of the glow, I think, when I do that. So um, it's a little bit of a handicap working with the adjustment layer because you have to keep turning it on and off and if you want to get the same colors underneath. Um, and then I add snow, because snow is always always nice to get some movement in there, some mood. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Let me know what you think at the bottom of this video. Um, comment, ask questions, I'll try to answer them. Um, and subscribe. <laughs>